The one more thing is what about those light waves? We still have a 200-year-old experiment that's perfectly good. Uh, we can do it in our own living rooms today, uh, where we see light going through and we see touch. Well, back in 1900, we developed some problems with that. Um, and that's quite good. Well, if I look at it mathematically, light ought to act like a dimmer switch, you know. As you pump in more and more energy, it gets brighter and brighter and brighter. It's like turning the dimmer switch. You know, I still up. That's the way light ought to work according to our theory. But we actually find that it doesn't work like that. It works more like a three-way bulb. It's, you know, 40 watts. And it stays 40 watts as you're turning until it clicks. And now the other bulb chips in, and it's uh, 60 watts. And it stays at 60 watts as you're turning, and it clicks. And the other bulb comes on, and now we've got 100 watts. So, 40 watts, 60 watts. Nothing happening, 100 watts. And that's the way light's behaving, instead of this nice, smooth, continuous curve that we're used to. Uh, along comes Albert Einstein in 1905, and he says, well, the reason you're having a problem with this is you're thinking about it wrong. Uh, what you think of is like water, uh, it, it, light you're increasing is like a, a pitcher filling up with water, you know, and it should be nice and smooth. It fills up with water that you pour it in. Well, that's not what's happening says Mr. Einstein, what's happening is you got boom, I know your graph is like that, boom, 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 and boom. And that, says Mr. Einstein, is what's happening with your life, and that explains your problem, and so there's no problem. Uh, so, Albert Einstein says, light is particle. And I just proved it. And he did so good that everyone said, huh, you're right. Uh, so ever since 1905, people have known that light is particle. Albert Einstein figured it all out. Uh, and asked, what they did then was they said, well, if that's true, then we're not really getting these stripes of light as overlapping waves. What you're telling me is light is particle, so it's hitting the film one particle at a time. If, that's, if what you're saying is true, that's what's happening, right? Albert Einstein says that. <laughs> I'm from Missouri, show me. And what they eventually do is get uh, better and better film, uh, photo charge coupler, charge coupling device, uh, something that can go down to detect one photon at a time. And when they do that, they find out that what is happening in Young's double fluid experiment since 18 whatever it was I said, um, is light hitting the photographic plate, the film, the charge coupling device, uh, one photon at a time. And so the stuff we get that seems so comforting and so sure, and so it's good proof, frankly, that light was waves, well, it turns out that it's just a light bulb sending out billions and billions and billions of photons faster than we can count them. And they're hitting the film billions and billions at a time, but one at a time. And they come up with an interference pattern, which we thought we could explain before, but now we can't explain. So now we know that this, what you just seen, is how everything looks from the evanescent sunshine walk outside on a spring day, hopefully soon. You feel the warmth on your arm. You can't hold it in your hand. It's like a thought. Uh, that's where we start. Light works like that. Particles, one at a time. Uh, we know that quarks uh, work like that if we could actually pull them apart, which we're having a hard time doing now, but, you know, eventually they'll do it. Uh, anyway, collections of three quarks, we know they behave like that because we can do this experiment with uh, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Uh, molecules, add a few atoms together, two hydrogen atoms, one uh, oxygen atom. Is that going to behave like that when we throw them at the double slit? Guesses? Huh? You, you know the answer. Say yes. Yeah. Why? Because it's so implausible that that must be the answer I'm looking for. Yeah, well, that's the answer. 
Uh, when you throw water molecules at the double slit, this is what happens. Um, larger molecules, you think, you think a molecule as big as carbon-60, 60, 60 carbon atoms clumped together, you think that would go through a double slit in this funny fashion? Yeah, you're right. Uh, how about toaster oven? What's the difference between a carbon-60, a large molecule, and a to toaster oven, which is made up of lots of carbon-60, uh, not carbon-60, carbon-14, uh, probably, I don't know what kind of carbon, uh, in the steel and in the soot. You know, there's a lot of carbon built up on, from my toast in the bottom of it, uh, last time I, you know, I checked. Uh, so there's a lot of carbon in there, steel, maybe a little plastic, which is carbon benzene ring. Is there anything, if, if, if 60 carbon molecules tied together can go through a double slit and act like this, well, is there anything to prevent a toaster oven from going through the double slit and acting like this? No. There's practical problems. It turns out that um, it would take a toaster oven to go longer through a double slit the way it would have to go through a double slit uh, to do this. It would take longer than the universe has been in existence. So nobody's going to be around to uh, actually find out the result. But the math is so solid that there is really no question that that is how a toaster oven would go through the double slit. With current technology, it appears that something the size of a virus uh, a lot bigger than the carbon-60 atom, uh, a little bit less than the bacterium, but you can see them under a microscope. It appears that with current technology, a virus could be sent through a double slit experiment, and it would behave exactly like that. Quick summary. A wave is motion within a medium. Wave-like behavior is never seen, never observed directly, because every observation, every time we look for something, it's a particle. Light, electron, whatever, we always look for something and it's a particle. We find it. We locate it in space with our eyes, with instruments, so that we can read, and it turns out it's a particle. So we never actually see any wave. We never see, you know, with wave interference, if you add a quarter and a half, you get three quarters. Well, we never see three quarters. We always see one at a time. And yet, uh, despite that fact, each unobserved particle, for some reason, obeys a distribution rule that exactly, perfectly matches the mechanics of waves. Now, we also know that when, upon observation, the wave-like distribution over time disappear. Now, these things do not obey a wave-like distribution law. And we know that the distribution of particles depends on what we know and when we know it. 